Hey guys, this video is going to cover some interesting aspects of influenza, including the current state of evidence regarding human-to-human -human transmission in the scientific literature. We'll scratch beneath the surface and also shine some light on the remarkable field experiments that were done during the Spanish flu. Much of the evidence base is probably not what you'd expect, particularly if you're a healthcare professional like myself or listened to most public health advice over the years. In fact, are all those commonly touted infection prevention measures actually providing any benefits at all? Stay tuned to find out. Whatever platform you're watching this on, please give it a thumbs up if you like the content and consider sharing and subscribing on here so we can stay in touch. The Spanish flu is known as one of the deadliest pandemics on record. The worldwide mortality has been estimated to be anywhere from 15 to 100 million people, although a more recent publication suggested it was probably towards the lower end of the range at around 17 million. At that time, the world's population was probably around 1.8 billion, so we are potentially talking about an almost 1% worldwide mortality rate. There are problems with these estimates, however. Firstly, the difficulty in obtaining accurate statistics from that time particularly, as it was complicated by being a chaotic period at the end of World War I. Obviously this could push numbers in either direction. Secondly, there are problems with the diagnostic criteria. How do we know all the deaths were caused by exactly the same thing? Diagnostic criteria was not standardised and record keeping was usually limited or non-existent. However, there was a widely held belief that a pathogen was being transmitted between hosts and on face value, this would appear to be the most likely explanation to many observers. And in fact, this is still the most likely explanation you will hear today. Many clusters of people seemingly got infected and many of them died. However, there are actually some problems with this widely accepted theory on both epidemiological and experimental grounds. Firstly, with regards to the epidemiological patterns, there are disputes about where the epidemic began. Some claim it began in February 1918 in the Spanish town of San Sebastian, close to the French border on the Atlantic coast. Some claim the same outbreak date, but a completely different place, thousands of kilometres away from San Sebastian in New York City, on the other side of the Atlantic. Further candidates include Kansas, France and China, and perhaps you've heard of others too. In any case, there seems to be many reports of outbreaks all going on around the same time. However, this presents a challenge to the transmission theory. How were numerous places describing simultaneous outbreaks? This was in an age prior to mass air travel and it would be difficult to attribute the pattern to the shipping and railway routes of the time. What many people, and I believe this includes most doctors, don't know is that at the time clinical experiments were carried out in an attempt to demonstrate human-to-human -human transmission of the disease. One such experiment took place in Boston in November 1918. The subjects were comprised of 62 healthy sailors charged with delinquency and sent to prison. They had been promised a pardon under the condition that they take part in an experiment. Clearly, back in those days, there were no pesky ethics committees to run your trial protocols past. Most of the men who volunteered had not yet had influenza, so they were thought to be particularly susceptible to infection. In her book, Flu, scientific journalist Gina Collata describes what happened. Navy doctors collected the mucus from men who were desperately ill from the flu, gathering thick viscous secretions from their noses and throats. They sprayed mucus from flu patients into the noses and throats of some men and dropped it into other men's eyes. In one attempt, they swabbed mucus from the back of the nose of a man with the flu and then directly swabbed one patient's nasal septum and rubbed it directly onto the nasal septum of one of the volunteers. Now, anyone involved in clinical trials today will be amazed at what used to go on. You've got to hand it to them though, this was a serious field experiment that could help provide the necessary transmission evidence. Kalata goes on further. Trying to simulate what happens naturally when people are exposed to flu victims, the doctors took 10 of the volunteers onto the hospital ward where men were dying of the disease. The sick men lay huddled on their narrow beds, burning with fever, drifting in and out of sleep in a delirium. 
the 10 healthy men were given their instructions. Each was to walk up to the bed of a sick man and draw near him, lean into his face, breathe in his fetid breath and chat with him for five minutes to be sure that the healthy man had had a full exposure to the sick man's disease. The sick man was to exhale deeply while the healthy man drew the sick man's breath directly into his own lungs. Finally, the flu victim coughed five times in the volunteer's face. Each healthy volunteer repeated these actions with 10 different flu patients. Each flu patient had been seriously ill for no more than three days, a period when the virus or whatever it was that was causing the flu should still be around in his mucus, in his nose, in his lungs. Well, they certainly weren't wearing masks or social distancing, so some people would be getting pretty nervous about all of this. Let's go back to Gina Colata's book to see what happened, where we find she concludes that not a single healthy man got sick. A comparable experiment carried out under much stricter conditions took place in San Francisco with 50 imprisoned sailors. But once again, the results did not correspond with what the doctors had expected. Gina Collada writes, Scientists were stunned. If these healthy volunteers did not get infected with influenza, despite doctors' best efforts to make them ill, then what was causing this disease? How exactly did people get the flu? Now, this doesn't conclusively prove that human-to-human -human transmission never occurred, but it certainly indicates that healthy individuals were not susceptible to catching the disease. And the Spanish flu is often touted as one of the most infectious and deadly flus that was capable of killing young people as well as old. So fast forward to 2021 to see what public source Wikipedia says about how people get influenza. With regards to transmission, the influenza page states that people who are infected can transmit influenza viruses through breathing, talking, coughing and sneezing, which spread respiratory droplets and aerosols that contain virus particles into the air. A person susceptible to infection can then contract influenza by coming into contact with these particles. Okay, did someone do further clinical experiments to formally establish this? The Wikipedia statement gives us two references, the first of which is a 2019 paper titled Influenza Virus Related Critical Illness, Pathophysiology and Epidemiology. It is immediately apparent that this is a review article and not a clinical experiment. The review article states that virus transmission occurs when a susceptible individual comes into contact with aerosols or respiratory fomites from an infected individual. And they provide a reference for this, which is the Textbook of Influenza, second edition. Okay, this is getting suspicious as we want a specific study experiment rather than a textbook. However, I don't want to miss anything. And after a search, I managed to track down a copy of the book which has over 500 pages. But to show my dedication to you guys, I checked the approximately 100 pages mentioning transmission in the textbook. Most of them relate to indirect evidence with epidemiological patterns and at other times it is purely speculative in nature with a lot of maybes. They did state that with regards to HIV-N1 influenza or avian flu, there were clear examples of unsustained human-to-human -human transmission and give a reference for this. However, this is a 2008 paper reporting on an unwell father and his son who died, who had close contact with 91 people, out of which two developed mild symptoms. I don't think that's a clear example at all. Even the title states probable, and that was based on H5N1 virus isolates from the two cases. Hmm, isolated. By the way, we do a whole expose on H5N1 and virus mania with a chapter 7 titled H5N1 avian flu and not a glimmer of proof. So despite being over 500 pages, the so-called textbook of influenza didn't provide the evidence of a clinical trial establishing human to human transmission. However, the book did feature this colorful picture. Don't worry, I'll search for experiments involving whales, ducks, and dogs in the future. <coughs> yeah, we share the same affliction. All right, that wild goose chase consumed a lot of time, but at least I can now say that I'm very familiar with the textbook of influenza. We'll head back to Wikipedia to check the second reference they list. <laughs> 
This is an article titled Transmission Rates of Respiratory Viruses Among Humans and it looks like another review article. Table 2 of the review article claims to list the evidence on transmission rates of respiratory viruses and at the bottom of the table they list four studies under experimental and observational data. And let's have a look at these. The first was a convenient sample of patients admitted to an emergency department with influenza-like illnesses. The diagnosis of influenza was made by PCR analysis. If they tested positive, air samplers were used to collect particles carrying influenza virus and they concluded that 43% of positive cases were emitting influenza. But how did they know the air samples contained virus? They performed PCR analysis on the air samples. Aside from the problems of using PCR to conclude that they had a virus and there was no control group for comparison, the study did not demonstrate one example of human to human transmission at all. Okay, on to the second reference. In this observational study, 12 subjects who were diagnosed with influenza with a positive PCR test provided exhaled breath filter samples. Based on PCR analysis, they concluded that we detected the influenza virus RNA in the exhaled breath of four 33% subjects. Okay, at least they are being more accurate and not claiming that they had detected a virus. However, again, this paper doesn't show any examples of human to human transmission. On to the third reference, which is a paper titled Viable Influenza A Virus in Airborne Particles Expelled During Coughs Versus Exhalations. Sounds a bit more promising, although there's no mention of transmission in there. The study describes collection of airborne particles from subjects testing so-called PCR positive for influenza A. They concluded that viable influenza A virus was found in cough aerosol samples from 28 out of 53 subjects and in exhalation aerosol samples from 22 out of 52 subjects. But when they say viable, do they mean able to cause infection in someone else? No, they mean viable based on viral replication assay with PCR. The study does not show human to human transmission. So we get to the final reference from the table that claimed to provide the evidence of transmission routes of respiratory viruses. And it is a paper titled Detection and Isolation of Airborne Influenza A, H3N2 Virus Using a Sciotis Personal Cascade Impactor Sampler. Well, that's the flashiest sounding paper and it even features the schematic of an apartment that looks like a crime scene. But by now you're probably not surprised to hear that there was no establishment of aerosol or even human to human transmission. This was simply two people in an apartment with influenza like illnesses. One thing that could be established from the paper was that influenza vaccines were not protective for the two patients of this report. Perhaps no surprise there if you saw the state of evidence for flu vaccines in my video Immune System and Vaccines Part 2. In summary, none of the studies from Table 2 provided any documented cases of direct transmission. And? and no transmissions were made. Oh. And? and? No transmissions were made. Oh. In fact, none of the studies were designed to show this. Even with regards to their findings, none of them had appropriate comparative control groups, so they are not good examples of the scientific method either. So after all that, people who are infected can transmit influenza viruses through breathing, talking, coughing and sneezing. And a person susceptible to infection can then contract influenza by coming into contact with these particles. Can clearly not be traced back to a clinical trial establishing this. And the Spanish flu studies were remarkable in that no human to human transmission could be demonstrated. You might have thought that the textbook of influenza would have a whole section on this, but it seems to be swept under the rug. Questioning widely accepted theories about influenza seems to incense some people who claim that the science is settled, but clearly it is not. Of note, another doctor, Robert Edgar Hope Simpson, challenged the belief of direct transmission in his 1992 treatise, The Transmission of Epidemic Influenza. Hope Simpson was another who pointed out that historically many epidemiological patterns of simultaneous outbreaks cannot be explained by direct transmission. He postulated that the influenza virus is already widely spread amongst populations, 
sitting dormant, but sometimes triggering influenza in the host by factors that are influenced by seasonal variation. Perhaps not surprisingly, his work seems to be largely ignored by the medical pharmaceutical industry. One of the themes of virus mania is that the obsession with so-called dangerous microbes has distorted medical science and led us away from research and measures that actually make us healthy. In the introductory section, we write, bacteria, fungi, and viruses are omnipresent in the air, in our food, and our mucous membranes, but we aren't permanently sick. When a disease, generally held to be contagious, breaks out, only some individuals become sick. This is clear evidence that microbes, whatever potential they may have to make you sick, cannot be the lone cause of disease. If you go looking for microbes, you'll certainly find them. It has been estimated that in an average litre of seawater, there are billions of viruses, or at least virus-like particles. You'll also find billions of them all over us and in the air. But detection is not the same as disease causality or establishing transmissibility. Personally, I think influenza is another fascinating topic of medical science, but the evidence as it stands is quite different to what many of us have been taught. It is a big topic, so please let me know in the comments if there are other aspects of influenza you would like me to cover in future videos. I think I can anticipate some of them already. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description.